1 Timothy 6, verse 1. Let all who are under the yoke as slaves regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine may not be spoken against. And let those who have believers as their masters not be disrespectful to them, because they are brethren, but let them serve them all the more, because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arrive envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. And if we have food and clothing and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we ask you to grant an abundance of grace in not only hearing and understanding your word, but embracing it and applying it. So we pray that you will bless us as we feed on this portion of the bread of life. We ask in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, amen. Kindly be seated. You may have noticed that the proposed title for this service is one of God's rare jewels. And that's a bit of a play on a title that's been around for several centuries. Jeremiah Burroughs' great book, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. And the word rare is used, I believe, advisedly and with great care. Jeremiah Burroughs lived from 1599 to 1647, and his book is still considered to be a Puritan classic. And his determination that true contentment is a rare commodity. And I'm inclined to think it's probably as rare as the grace of careful and unqualified humility. Thomas Boston, another Puritan writer who lived from 1676 through 1732, had this brief and succinct assessment on discontent. He said, discontent is a hellish sin. And J.C. Ryle, who wrote Holiness, also opined that contentment, we could say capital C contentment, was a rare commodity. So I have a question for you as we begin to think about the subject of godly contentment, contentment that's in agreement with the word of God. How many really content people do you know? And I suspect you know some. But I don't think in our culture, which advocates discontent with one's status, that the testimony of a contented person is something that we often see, of a consistent testimony of Christ-centered contentment. I believe that 
In fact, our culture thrives on discontent. Certainly the advertising industry does, fostering discontent with our present st status and at the very easiest to observe level, trying to urge us and nudge us into being content discontent with what we have and always to get more. So I think in looking at this, which interestingly enough, there aren't a lot of places in scripture that talk about contentment itself. There's several references in the New Testament, a few in the Old, but contentment as a concept is not addressed abundantly, which may or not, may or not have some significance in terms of its rarity. But I do propose that defining it is helpful and I'm going to start by proposing a few concepts or thought processes that contentment is not. And contentment is first of all not ancient Greek or modern Stoicism, which defining somewhat uh, ordinarily could be described as grim endurance under trial. And the Greeks had a school of thought uh, called Stoicism and that uh, people endured in some kind of hopeless sense that uh, their, whatever their troubles were, but there was no sense of accepting the sovereignty of God in it or any learning from it. And it's not asceticism, which is the doctrine of living in a very sparse and minimalistic way again with no reference to what God has called us to understand is a Christian walk. But especially I'm going to propose that contentment is not happiness. And we are in a country that has an industry of pursuing happiness. And I think that this is well worth reminding ourselves that happiness that's God-honoring is an interesting commodity of which I can state dogmatically a certainty that the moment you begin to pursue happiness, you are guaranteed to not find it. That happiness that is genuine and lasting comes only as a byproduct of responsible living as God defines responsible living. That true happiness comes when we seek to order our life according to scripture and focus on our walk with the Lord and serving him. And then happiness sooner or later comes up and overtakes us as it were by surprise. But the minute you pursue happiness and especially by seeking it through the acquisition of things you are guaranteed to be a most unhappy individual. And it certainly is not the temporary satisfaction that comes from satisfying our lusts of having appetites that are out of control, satiated. That is not contentment. So what is it? So what is contentment? Well, A.W. Pink, who lived from 1886 to 1954, defined it as a tranquil soul being satisfied with what God has appointed. That's a lovely definition. A tranquil soul satisfied with what God has appointed. For starters, I think we can say that clearly contentment is the opposite of envy and jealousy. And there are many texts that indicate contentment is not to be understood as the fulfillment of envy. And our text this evening reflects upon that. Those who wish to f get rich and fall into temptation do so into a snare with many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. So contentment 
does not have harmful desires in its makeup. But much more, I think we can say it's the opposite of covetousness, which is certainly uh, a commandment that I believe we accept almost as normative in our culture of not to lust for what we do not have. The Tenth Commandment um, certainly speaks to the issue of contentment and the refutation of discontent. We're not to covet what is not ours and what we do not need. So a few texts to ponder as far as the opposite of discontent. If you care to follow along, Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 16. Better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. Now, that's very straightforward and certainly agrees with our Timothy text. And then Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, verse 16. And he told them the parable, saying... The land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? Covetousness, which the rich man had, is deadly, and Christ's discernment of the deadliness is found in verse 21. So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I submit that contentment could be described succinctly as being rich toward God, and God's terms of what is richness, of course, spiritual richness. And then if you think about it, the Israelites are cited as an example of discontent in 1 Corinthians 10 in a passage that applies their experience directly to us. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from the spiritual rock who followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us that, they should, that we should not crave evil things as they also craved. And that's a good synonym for the word lust. And I would remind you that by definition, not necessarily the only one, but a lust by definition is an appetite that controls us as opposed to us controlling the appetite. And so we tend to think of lusts primarily as being just sexual, but there are all manner of appetites that can overtake us and control us to our harm and hurt. And then Hebrews 13 is a very helpful additional text on this subject of covetousness. Hebrews 13. Verse 5. Let your character be free from the love of money. 
being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? And there is an implication in this text that I believe is worth noting before we move on. And that is the implication that many find their sense of security in the acquisition of wealth or things or both. And clearly, that is not a right understanding of where our security lies. It lies in the promise that God gives us, his covenant people, where he says, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. The Lord is my helper, and I shall not be afraid. But I believe there's another element to the sin of uncontented thinking, or, if you will, an element of contentedness, and that's found in Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Reminds us of promises this morning concerning Christ's second coming. Another assertion of that. Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now this text bears scrutiny and careful application. The peace of God, rightly understood, is that deliverance from the anxiety and doubt that comes with being uncertain as to our state of grace or lack thereof. Are we saved or not? And when we are brought by the grace of God to a right understanding of the gospel and given the grace to embrace it, to commit to it, and to trust in none other than Jesus Christ as our Redeemer, there comes with that a peace, a marvelous spiritual and indeed emotional and interpersonal peace, a social peace, a sense of peace even in the midst of chaos. And verse 7 has a profound promise concerning this peace of God, which we could call the contentment that comes with knowing we are truly redeemed and belong to Christ as his purchased child. The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, in other words, we cannot understand it fully, shall guard your hearts and your minds. Guard your hearts and your minds. It doesn't say might guard our heart and our mind. It says it shall guard our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. When our minds are guarded, they are guarded against error and against falling into sin in some significant measure. To have our hearts and minds guarded is a great privilege. And that peace of God that passes all understanding can be described as contentment with a capital C. It's a wonderful blessing. And I know that some of you have told me over time of people you know that radiated a sense of contentment that was obvious, if not tangible. Now, I didn't say that this morning, but there is a truth about our society that's well to remember. It's easier, in one sense, to have a clear and unequivocal uh, 
testimony for Christ in this present evil age. I can remember well before World War II that people described being a Christian as being an American. And I encountered that many times, that sloppy uh, alignment of the assumption of being an American citizen with our Christian antecedents constituted evidence of redemption. All it did constitute was evidence that maybe we gave tip the hat to the at least the second table of the law, the Ten Commandments, being an American, but not much else in terms of the kingdom. So thankfulness, which is a precursor to embracing and experiencing in an ongoing way the peace of God, is a response of the believing heart that God integrates into his gracious providential protection, guarding of our hearts and our minds. And then, of course, we have to be careful not to omit the emphasis of that is in Christ Jesus. I think this is one of the neglected marks of the blessing of being right with God. And giving thanks is not something that takes years of study. It's something that any one of us can choose to do daily and often. And we can verbalize it and when that's appropriate or say it in our hearts. But thanking God for the blessings he gives, and I might add the eyes to see those blessings, is one of the more rewarding choices that we can make as redeemed sons and daughters of the Most High God. Contentment is the opposite of pride and arrogance. And it is a major part of God-centered, God-blessed, God-given humility, which I believe may well be the rarest grace God gives. I think that contentment it can well agree with this as a perception by William Plummer, an American pastor who lived from 1802 to 1880, when he said, are you ambitious? Then you are your own tormentor. Are you ambitious? Then you are your own tormentor. Now, I am not saying that all ambition is wrong, but I think contentment is the opposite of all ambition that is fleshly and greedy or self-centered and self-aggrandizing. Contentment is inseparable from a right understanding of God's character and person. And one quote that I found that was, I thought, especially helpful is accepting the truth that I, am not, I do not have sufficient wisdom to direct my own affairs. How about that one? I do not have sufficient wisdom to direct my own affairs. That dovetails very nicely with Paul's great declaration in Romans 8 that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. Contentment clearly cannot be apart from an acknowledgement of the preeminence of God in our life and indeed every aspect of it. God is eminently fit to govern us and direct us at all times. Eminently fit to govern us. Personally, and this is just an opinion, 
I believe one of the most important epistemological texts of the Old Testament is Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, where Solomon tells us that we are to not lean on our own understanding nor be wise in our own eyes, but to pursue the Lord's direction and to accept his governance. And don't lean on our own understanding. Don't be wise in our own eyes, but in all our ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. So again, a little bit of personal application. In your heart of hearts, do you want God to direct your paths? Really. I mean, really, really, really. Deep in your heart, can you say before God, Lord, without reservation, without mental reservation of any kind, I want you to direct my paths. Would you turn to Psalm 25? Psalm 25, beginning with verse 8. Well, the pages aren't cooperating here. I'll eventually get there. Psalm 25, verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice. And he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his, custom, his covenant and his testimonies. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. Contentment, believe it or not, as well as being a gift of grace, is a choice. We are not puppets in respect to this if we are redeemed. We have the choice of choosing to be content with what God has given us and where he has placed us. Hear the words of Paul in Acts chapter 20, verse 31. Therefore, be on the alert. These are words to the elders of the church at Ephesus. Remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. A personal declaration of the Apostle Paul, three years in an intense ministry in the city of Ephesus, and he never coveted anything that belonged to those Ephesian believers. The beginning of the New Testament has at its forefront the ministry of John the Baptist, following, of course, the events of Christ's birth and escape from Herod's murderous efforts to exterminate him. Luke chapter 3. John the Baptist is preaching to his hearers in the wilderness. Some of the tax gatherers came to him to be baptized, verse 12. And they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. And some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what about us? What shall we do? And he said, Do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Remarkable. 
to Roman soldiers, part of an occupying army in Israel of that day. Jeremiah Burroughs, who wrote that book I mentioned at the beginning of our consideration, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, described contentment as the opposite of the desperate risings of the heart against God by rebellion. You may remember that Samuel told King Saul when Saul had failed to obey him concerning exter exterminating the Amalekites and their livestock, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Rebellion is an absolutely and always present element of discontent, where we are rebelling against the providential government of God in our lives and the lives of others. So let's go back for a minute to 1 Timothy 6. And carefully consider Paul's exhortation on this subject again. Verse 6, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompany, accompanied by contentment. Now, I'd like you to think a bit about that. That Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, you've been exhorted to be godly. I've counseled you to be godly. But if you would have the richest return and sense of blessing in your godliness, it must be accompanied with contentment. Accompanied with contentment. The truth that I'm not sufficient in my own wisdom to direct my own affairs is a given that is an inseparable element of accepting God's providence. When you consider what Paul said in Romans 8.28, that bears heavily upon this subject of contentment. Let's turn there. Romans 8. Beginning with verse 26. And in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. That is the immediate preceding thought of the Spirit's ministry interceding for us in conjunction, of course, with Christ's ministry as a pre preparation for considering verse 28, acknowledging that we do not know how to pray as we ought, but God has given the Spirit the ministry of praying for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Paul says, we know that God causes all things, all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And then consider the breadth and depth of that purpose. Verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Can you get a connection here? God is saying to the Roman congregation and to us that God is so 
great and sovereign and good, that there is no detail of our life he does not order if we're trusting him. And the ordering of our life has its beginnings in eternity with God's predestinating work. And so when we are fretful and discontented with his disposition of our life, we may not see it as that, but the net effect is that we are rejecting his preeminence and right as our creator to govern us in such a way that every detail of our lives has been planned ahead of time. And if I kick against the goads and I am dissatisfied with his providential management of my life, that is a profound rebellion against Almighty God and against Jesus Christ, his Son, our Redeemer. What is the purpose of being saved anyway? Are we being saved simply so we don't have to go to hell fire for eternity? Well, if that's the view that we have of salvation, we have a poverty-stricken view. The ultimate goal of our redemption is for God's per perfect purpose to be fulfilled in gathering from every age those whom he's called out of darkness into the light of the gospel to be a company, an assembly in heaven, praising him forever and ever, glorifying him forever and ever, enjoying him forever and ever. And he has perfectly determined, and I'm going to say custom designed, the trials and the afflictions as well as the blessings with which he's poured out upon us and glorified himself in the richness of his mercies. Consider the words that Paul wrote in Ephesians 2. Let's turn there for a moment. Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 4, Paul had this to say. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgression, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. In order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that one of the reasons that God is accomplishing his great redemptive purposes of saving us out of darkness into the light of the gospel is to be an occasion of testimony for the rest of time and eternity with respect especially to his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. A couple of down-to-earth thoughts. Think carefully for a moment. Have you ever longed for something that you wanted? and strove to get it against all opposition or difficulty or circumstance, only to find out it turned out to be a curse and not a blessing. Have you ever had that experience? It can happen. I've heard of one instance of a mother whose son was ill, seriously ill, and she pled with God and prayed and earnestly besought him to spare his son's life, and God did. And when the lad grew up, he became a rebellious person who eventually committed serious felonies and eventually was executed 
for crimes committed? Would she not have been better off with the memory of a child in whom the covenant promises of God's mercy to the children of believers would have been a highlight of her thinking? This may sound simple, perhaps even like a Peter Rabbit story being read to children, but it's so true. God knows best in everything. And if we are really and truly growing in grace, discovering his best will for us is a part of our growth in grace. Seeking his direction from scripture and accepting its integration with the providential events that come to light on a daily basis in our personal existence is a wise choice for the believer who seeks to grow in the grace of the Lord. I'd like you to think for a minute about biblical people that we have every reason to believe were saved, but who had dissatisfaction and discontent with God's providence. How about Sarah, Abraham's wife? Did she push Abraham to try to get a child in a way that was ungodly with Abraham, her servant, and of course Abraham's servant, Hagar? That was the beginning of the Arab race, which was a group of people that in generations following to the very present have in the providence of God been opposed to Christians, generally as cultures. Of course, that became regularized with the Muslim faith in the 700s. But that's a, something we can trace directly to her dissatisfaction. How about Rachel? Jacob's wife. Did she not insist angrily that Jacob had to provide for her a son? And she died in the childbirth of the second son, Benjamin. How about Jacob? Was he ambitious? Was he willing to deceive his father as well as his brother? to get the birthright that resulted in a lifelong adversarial problem between him and Esau? How about Solomon? Did Solomon seek to try every possible sensory delight? And he achieved it I know of no other man in history, sacred or secular, that had a thousand wives and concubines. And any man who thinks he can manage even two wives is arrogant, much less 998 additional ones or 99. But his, his indulging his lusts out of discontent with his lot resulted in the destruction of the nation of Israel. And I could go on. Think of Simon, the sorcerer mentioned in Acts, who wanted to buy the Holy Spirit. And he reaped for himself the terrible record of being accursed by the apostle. So it's not as if scripture doesn't give us much guidance. It gives us great guidance concerning the tendency that we have to discontent. Did not Paul the Apostle himself have discontent with John Mark in arguing with Barnabas whether John Mark could go with him on the journey, the missionary journey or not? And that put a great barrier between Paul and his beloved co-worker Barnabas. So contentment. Do you believe it can be cultivated? Or is it just something that we sort of sit by like a, 
candle and a candlestick and the table beside us. Interesting to observe, burns out, tough bananas, you get another candlestick. Or do you believe it's a condition and of mind, an equality of mind, that's not only commanded, but a blessing if earnestly sought according to the word of God. I believe one of the good helps to avoid the trap of discontent, and especially, but not always, over money and the love of money, is to remember what we really deserve. When I am tempted to feel sorry for myself because of some trial, I find it exceedingly helpful to remember that I deserve to be burning in the fires of hell, where the torments are mentioned as being in darkness, with our bodies full of gnawing worms perpetually eating us, incredible torment of heat, unbearable thirst, and a few other characteristics that are not necessarily enumerated. But to remember that but for the sovereign grace of God, that would be my lot, I find is exceedingly helpful in recovering my perspective and rejoicing with what God has given me, however much of a trial that may be at certain times. Would you turn to Proverbs 30? Proverbs chapter 30. To the prayer of Augur. A remarkable prayer, in my opinion. Beginning with verse... Two things I ask of you. Here he's praying to God. Two things I ask of you. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies from me. That's the first thing he asks. And this morning, if the texts concerning the second coming of Christ and the deception of the unsaved concerning that coming truth meant something this morning. It's no small or issue of small consequence to pray, keep deception and lies far from me. A wise prayer. But notice the second prayer. Give me neither poverty nor riches. In other words, God, give me what I can manage. Give me what's right for me with my meager spiritual skills. Give me, Lord, enough to maintain me, but not so much that it will provide an occasion for turning away, however slightly. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that's my portion, what I need. And then verse 9, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. What a magnificent prayer for the grace of contentment. Now, if you will, please turn for a moment to Hebrews once again. Hebrews 13. We've read this text already, but it bears repetition. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your character be free from the love of money... And that's so high profile in a culture that's money obsessed, it's easy to forget the next part of the petition. 
Hebrews 13, verse 5. Being content with what you have. Now, I want to say, especially to young people, young men, there is a place for ambition. But ambition not guarded by truth can become a curse. I don't know if any of you noted in the last couple weeks or months, the man who invented the service called Uber, which is another form of taxi service, has been kicked out of the company and the reason stated in a secular publication, his ambition overran him. His ambition and lust to control and grow. In other words, he was not content with the blessings God had given him in that remarkable niche that God initially gave him the discernment to address. For he himself has said, that is, God has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we may confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? I remember as a student at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, I did not receive any help from the family in getting through but worked on campus and managed to get a few scholarships to provide for me while I was a student. And I can remember times when I was down to 10 cents and had nothing with which to buy the next meal. And every single time, God provided something. He never never left me without sufficient food or other bodily needs. I think a good place to close is with two texts. The first from Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 beginning with verse 13. Now I'm going to start with verse 12. 13 is not a good choice. Middle of a sentence. And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you so also should you. And beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Verse 15, and let the peace of Christ, we could say the contentment that comes from knowing we are redeemed and in the care of Christ, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let contentment rule in your heart to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I've never encountered a person who had or has a profound commitment to express thanks to God as being discontented. People, those rare people who thank God regularly for everything, trials, as well as blessings of other sorts, I've never seen as being obviously discontented. But notice what he says. 
and whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And that's with verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. And so with that, I want to turn to the word of Christ in conclusion. John chapter 15. As we turn there, by this time I trust you realize there are all kinds of aspects of the subject of content, being content or discontent that we've not yet addressed. But one of them is the issue of joy. Contented people are able to rejoice. John 15, verses 4 through 5, first of all. Abide in me, and I in you. The words here of Christ. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Whatever you wish, it shall be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy, my joy, this is Christ speaking, may be in you and that your joy may be made full, that your contentment will overflow. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you 